Warning, this program will discuss adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Thank you so much. Uh, so appreciate being here. I do have um, a very positive confession to make, and that is that I have achieved self-mastery over Villanova University. <laughs> uh, my passions have been disordered ever since I came here. Um, I, I am just figuring this place out, and now I leave. <laughs> now I know what to do, and I go home. No, this is a true story, kind of a true story. Um, two nights ago, uh, I was racing back to the lower 40 acres or whatever that it, where I'm staying, and I'm um, kind of gingerly making my way <laughs> over the overpass, right? And um, um, it was at dusk, and I was thinking, I need to get back before it's dark because I, I, I'm not quite sure where I'm staying. And um, I heard this, this beautiful voice behind me going, St. Clair? St. Clair, and I thought, I turned around and I said, no, Andrew Comiskey, not St. Clair. <laughs> she might be of more help to you right now than I will be. She said, no, where's St. Clair? Where's the dorm? And I said, I'm going to St. Clair. So the embodiment of liberty led her, led her into uh, the homeland there. Um, yes, so many victories this week. Um, I um, so appreciated um, the opening talk by um, uh, Father Paul on when I am weak, then I am strong. It really is the plumb line reality, I think, for, for all of us involved with courage. Um, just uh, en route to coming to this conference, um, I received some really bad news, and bad news to me, whatever, some bad news is worse to us in the particulars of our life, and it was kind of leveling news for me. And so uh, when I arrived in my room and was sitting there before the Lord, I'm thinking, Lord, is this the enemy, or what's going on? You know, couldn't this have waited till next week, you know, when I'm not preoccupied with other things? and I really was leveled, and the Lord said, well, that's, that's exactly what I had in mind. It's exactly what I wanted. I wanted you to be leveled. I wanted you to be reduced to me. And the good news and the bad news, if you will, is that um, I, I have been trained in some ways. I've, I've learned uh, in the bad news to, to, to find an invitation uh, to him. Pure and simple, pure and simple, no platitudes, no quick answers, just him, the one who is there, the, the one whose cross invites me to join my little cross, momentary afflictions, to him. And so I had the privilege of just spending that afternoon before him. No problem solving, not listening for the answer, He's the answer. He's the answer, right? And just to be with him. And in that beautiful way that bad news invites us to be reduced to him, his strength uh, at work in our utter inability to do anything about some of the news that we face, except to trust him, which is actually a lot. Uh, as St. Faustina says, with Jesus, everything, without him, nothing. Only worldly sorrow. Only our God can transform such sorrows into an invitation to the sweetest of intimacies. Amen? Amen. When we are weak, then we are strong. So true. So true as we return home soon. Um, I am actually on an Encourage team at my parish. I love Encourage. I love it. I'm so grateful for my leader, Becky Turner of Kansas City, 
who has taken up the charge of leading this great group, groundbreaking in our parish. And what a privilege it is to meet with the parents, the spouses uh, for whom homosexuality has run into them like a broadside accident, like what? What's this? What's it about? Why do you do this? How do I live? And have chosen in the face of other people's bad decisions to be converted, to get saved. The saved getting saved, nothing better than that. Nothing less than the new evangelization, the saved getting saved. It doesn't have so much to do with ensuring a certain moral response on a son or daughter or spouse's part. If that's why we're doing this, then it, it almost borders on witchcraft, doesn't it? Karma, right? I came to this stupid conference. You better repent, right? <laughs> you know, it's kind of what we think. That's human, but it's wrong, isn't it? Uh, uh, how much better to say, Jesus, I, I, I need to know you more. This is, this, is, this is my bad news that I want to become good news that, that invites me deeper into your heart. And uh, what a privilege. What a privilege. Honestly, I think you guys are the heroes. I do. I come out of same-sex background. Some of that's a mystery, and some of it's because I'm kind of a dope. I've made bad choices. I've contributed to my own problem. And I did that, right? Those of you who are here supporting those who, who are walking and working this out, you're in a different category. You've been grafted in, in a sense. You've been leveled by someone else's disorder. And um, you're my hero. You're my heroines, honestly. Yeah. And I had a little prayer, if I might, from Isaiah that I would like to pray over um, the Encourage parents and spouses. Um, and would you mind? You don't have to. Uh, in Catholicism, it's all free will. No one's coerced. You don't have to do this. Good news for us former evangelicals. <laughs> all free will, really. <laughs> no lawsuits. <laughs> uh, but if you're a parent or a, um, a, a, a spouse, I'd love to just pray a blessing on you. And um, maybe we could even, if you, people around them want to kind of lay hands on you, just in a way, would you mind? If you would like that anyway, stand. And I want to pray something over you. Um, and if you're around them and feel comfortable laying hands on them, right? You're an agent of the Holy Spirit as much as anybody. And uh, let's, let's, let's stir up the gift in, in our brothers and sisters who, who are such a gift to us, really. And the Lord directed me to these verses in Isaiah, which I love and which are keys for me in, in interceding for people I love and uh, people who take me down, right? Good thing. Isaiah 43, verses 3 through 7. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead since you are precious and honored in my sight. And because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, people in exchange for your life. Don't be afraid. I am with you. I will bring back your children from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Father, we're so grateful 
for these parents, for these spouses. We thank you for these ones uh, whom you have invited into conversion. Thank you for, for, for their humility in the face of great suffering, for their surrender in the face of those whom they cannot control. You have not given them that freedom. Thank you that in their obedience, many spiritual sons and daughters take heart. These are the ones who are making a way for us to come home. Those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Thank you for the way that you have made for us to come home. Encourage them, God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Encourage men and women. Love you. So grateful to be among you. What a privilege to be a part of this good work. Let's talk a little about Pope Francis. Uh, he launched a thousand speculations that perhaps still reverberate through our little weary souls when he quipped to a, an Italian journalist, who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? In response to questions about persons with same gender attraction, including Catholic clergymen. Who am I to judge? Now, as Father Paul Cech said to me in a conversation about this, he is not the Pope's formal interpreter. And believe me, if Father Paul Cech isn't, how much less am I? <laughs> but I do know that in our increasingly gay-friendly climate, the Pope's words have become only too familiar. In many Christian circles, the believer who lovingly challenges the moral goodness of gay identity, practice, and marriage is usually shrugged off with a, who am I to judge? The paradox is, many who refuse to judge homosexuality are usually very quick to pronounce grave judgments on those who have a problem with homosexual behavior. I've mentioned my, my, my Encourage leader, who could not be a more loving woman, who is um, faithfully loving uh, a family member who is uh, gay identified. And um, she is a devout Catholic. She's surrounded by Catholics of varying degrees of devotion in her large extended family. And all that she gets from them for her hard and loving approach to uh, her loved one is grief. She's the unloving one. She's the judgmental one. She's the one who who doesn't have the hands in the heart of Jesus. So the paradox is that those of us who still hold to a genuinely loving view of, of homosexuality are those <laughs> who become the target of such rash, often vile judgments uh, from others. Now to be sure, Jesus makes a big deal about not judging people wrongfully. Yet he insists that we make proper moral judgments by relying upon his mercy and his discernment. The Apostle Paul follows suit. You could say he's our patron saint here. He urges us in the spirit of Jesus to judge those inside the church. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 12. So how do we make proper moral judgments without being judgmental? One key is to keep first things first, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God became flesh in order to break the stronghold of our moral disorders and to transform us into his own image. This is good news 
So stunning, in fact, that all other considerations must bow before the one who has come to make everything new. Becoming judgmental, then, in the truly negative sense, results from losing this gospel-centeredness. Losing sight of him, we do tend to become self-reliant and prone to self-justifications. We must defend ourselves. We're all we've got. Self-justified ones tend to judge wrongfully and defensively. And this is as much as a curse of the liberals as it is of the conservatives. For example, before I was a, before I was a Christian, all I could do was defend my gay self. I had nothing else. I had no other collateral. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know Jesus in that sense. And as a result, was, was, was left to really the very tight and stingy world of my own self-justification, at which point I became very judgmental towards anyone who dared challenge what was essentially my defense, the gay self. Mercy alone breaks the bonds of self-justification. Mercy alone has power to open up for us a whole new world. It frees us to live out of the words of Pope Emeritus Benedict, quoted by Pope Francis in the Joyful Gospel, when he says, being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Jesus, the good news, opens up for us a whole new horizon. He cuts a decisive path for us. He makes a way for divine love to surpass all other loves that compete for our hearts. United with him, Jesus our horizon, Jesus our path, Jesus our goal, we begin to become more like him. Part of the fruit of this Christ-likeness is the call and the capacity to make wise moral judgments. Such discernment invites new life for us and for others. Now the primary word in the New Testament for judging others is rooted in the word for judge. The Greek word kretes, the verb to judge, or the Greek krino, means to separate one thing from another, to select, to choose, to examine, to investigate. Judgment in the New Testament is anchored in the understanding of God as the judge, the one with the power to judge absolutely. That has a strong Old Testament precedent as well and refers to the all-seeing, all-knowing creator who determines the eternal fate of his creatures based on his complete knowledge of them. God the judge is, of course, the ultimate examiner of human hearts and thus the only one qualified to separate wheat from tares, sheep from goats, save from the unsaved. Jeremiah 17, verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, examine the mind, to reward a man according to what his deeds deserve. Peter brings up the similar theme when he says, since you call upon this Father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here with reverent fear. Jesus defines himself as one with the Father in judgment. My Father has entrusted all judgment to the Son, he says in John 5, 22 and 27. He has given the Son authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. One thing is clear. Only the Creator, Father and Son, has power to determine the eternal fate of his creatures. Glory, hallelujah, that frees us by forbidding us from judging others' eternal fates. 
Amen. When people ask me, well, what about this person's eternal fate? I'm like, how do I know? You know, ask someone who does, God. <laughs> the fact that we even aspire to usurp his role as judge reveals something ugly about us, doesn't it? It may not always, it usually does not express itself in our condemning other people to hell, but it usually involves lesser expressions of judgments in which we bind other people to a lesser image of themselves. Our own hurtful experiences with loved ones prompt defenses and fears that tempt us to reduce them to our image. That is usually far removed from the image of his or her creator. It's the defensive image of our own design. Wounded hearts pronounce final judgments as a way of self-protecting and as a way of getting even. We, the created, can operate outside the creator and close the horizon of another. This happens in, in incremental ways, in very, very mundane ways. Um, uh, my wife uh, uh, had a gay identified relative um, who was not a clever and lovely and whimsical gay man. Um, he was abusive and addictive and wrecked havoc upon the family as long as she knew him. Um, and so it was very easy for my wife to agree with his own self-loathing. We the twice born, we the saved, we the bearers of good news, we the wounded, we the dishonored, we seeking vindication for other loved ones hurt even more by the acting out of a family member. And so you can imagine, you know, this woman marrying me and kind of going, what? You're dealing with what? Tell me about your vision, version, interpretation of your SSA, because if it's anything like what I'm accustomed to, you've just lost a friend. And um, so in some ways, my conversion <laughs> became an invitation for her conversion, which became an invitation for converting how we understood her family member, how we could become good news to the bad news. He was the bad news of the family. He was the one that we were so grateful about when he chose not to come to the wedding or the, the holiday. Or It's like, oh, thank you, Jesus, answered prayer. <laughs> still answering Jesus, still on the throne. <laughs> Sorry. No, all carnal. Um, and understandable. Let's not pretend. Homosexuality is so sweet. Isn't it sweet? I hate that. I hate that. Aren't gay men sweet? I'm like, no, they're not. Aren't lesbians wonderful? No, they're not. No more than I would say that about any people group, that we're all so great and winning. You know, come on. Don't. Stop. Not true. Uh, and um, our hearts had to change, though, in order for us to become the good news, to be able to see deeper than what was obvious and painful. And it was a process of conversion for us. It was a, it was a process of surrendering him. It was a process of proactively seeking, seeking him out, seeking opportunities for encounter 
that would be free from some of the dynamics that tempted him to particular expressions of unloveliness. Getting him alone, in other words. Going the distance to know him in his world. And um, it was an arduous and beautiful process. Because of his choices, we knew that his life would be short, that he wouldn't have a full life as far as, you know, average uh, for today. And so we wanted to be ready for the time where we knew we would, we, we would have to, we would have to be the SWAT team, right? We would have to be the ones who, who, who frees him to, to die with dignity and to die much loved. And uh, sure enough, uh, that season came and uh, uh, my, my wife and, and her sibling and myself were, were able to, to be the church for him and uh, to draw very near. And of course, at those points, as we've all known with difficult loved ones who, who are, are fading, there can be a new sweetness, a new childlike uh, openness. And it was a beautiful month of, of loving him and of, of moving him down the coast from uh, San Francisco to um, non-demonically inflated real estate where he could stay for a couple of months or for a few weeks. And uh, uh, we had to get him out of the city just to stay solvent, right? And, uh, 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 and it, was a, it was a peaceful ending. Um, we, we spoke of Jesus. I, I took my opportunity, right? the evangelical in me. You can learn something from evangelicals. You can lead someone to the Lord, right? They, he couldn't go through our CIA people, you know? <laughs> he couldn't do a year, right? So it's like, okay, Jesus, Jesus, you know, calling, calling the old evangelical back, you know? Um, and so looking for a chance just to say, no, what about Jesus? You know, what about this Jesus? And so I just kept thinking of, you know, how Jesus said, you know, um, um, to the Father, unto you I, I surrender my spirit. Unto you, Father, I just, I give my spirit. I said, man, you're going to be at that point <laughs> at any point now. So let's just do it. That's all you got to do. Unto you, Father. In the name of Jesus, I, I yield myself. I give my spirit. You know, die before you die, right? <laughs> Offer it now. And, uh, and he was happy to do that. And I said, Lord, I really would like, I mean, this, you know, I'd like some evidence here. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's not going to be, you know, tremendous, you know, virtuous returns here. But, but I'd love something. And you know what? I found a rosary hanging in his closet. We were, you know, going through his stuff, packing. I found a rosary. And I thought, you know, he had no Catholic background. I thought, what's he doing with the rosary? So I took it, man. I'll take anything at this point, right? It's like, this is my confirmation, baby. In like, eh, he got it, man. The rosary in the closet. That's all I needed to know. So Jesus, when we're tempted to close someone else's horizon, he gives us a great chance to repent, right? And to say, God, I want to see what you see, and I want to be changed in how I offer myself, right? I got to change. I don't know what's going to happen with him, but I got to change. <laughs> got to give it my best shot, you know? Don't know how long he's got. Jesus gave us the chance to repent, to forgive him. It wasn't so hard for me to forgive him. Real challenge for my wife. She was the one who got beat up by him, right? Easy for me to say. When you get beat up by somebody, big deal to let him go. 
Mm. And then, as our great testimony the other day was, then to really love. Not just to forgive and move on, but to forgive and press in, to love them. To become a mirror and a provider of that one's dignity. We had that chance. Ah, so grateful. Now this applies as well to secular understanding of persons with same-sex attraction. We can all too make us a people group, a new ethnos, a group defined from birth as queer, who insists that others become baptized and confirmed as citizens of this brave new world. This new sexual orthodoxy is neither scientific nor moral. It's in truth a worldly spirituality. This is the way, walk in it. When I started studies at UCLA many, many years ago, um, there were two groups, two evangelistic groups. There was the state-funded gay group, so shiny and sexy and so appealing. Um, evangelistic, man. I mean, they did it right. You know, they were better evangelists than the evangelicals. And then there were the evangelicals who were also very prominent in many different faces of that. And so here I was, dealing with SSA, knowing about Jesus, wondering, wondering, two, two tribes uh, seeking my conversion. And of course, it's so much easier to worship a human person, another body, than it is the unknown God, right? the unseen God. So the gay thing got the best of me for a while there. And, uh, but then I discovered something. I discovered that it was actually a somewhat closed world. The heavens weren't opened. <laughs> it was a closed horizon. And in my seeking Jesus, in my wanting to know, wanting to know who is he, and, and who do I say he is, and who does he say I am? <laughs> In light of all of my identity conflicts at that time period, um, uh, I found little help, little openness to, to, to my seeking uh, the face of the God-man. And so I found a, a kind of fatalism that this is who you are. Don't start doing the Christian thing because this is who you are. Richard John Newhouse writes, fatalism is resigning ourselves to the inevitable. Faith is entrusting ourselves to the one worthy of our trust. I'm eternally grateful for the gift of faith I discovered on that campus and a dynamic community of faith of people who received me as I was and freed me to worship the God that we were discovering together. My words then became, Jesus, lead on. Become my goal and my path. I don't know what my sexual future is, but I know you are who you say you are. So become my horizon. Become my decisive direction. So grateful to discover that in my early 20s, huh? Naming one another as gay and reinforcing that identification closes a person's horizon. I think it's anti-gospel. St. James invokes the power of the creator when he entreats his readers to not close that horizon with false declarations about each other. He writes in John 4, 11 and 12, James 4, 11 and 12, Brothers, don't slander each other. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and to destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? At the gym I go to, I'm surrounded by a bunch of really buff guys, bulky guys, I not among them. And, uh, but I love them and they're my brothers and I see them regularly. There's something, there's something slightly religious about 
our times together there, our communal times. And there's a guy there who's peculiar. I'm, I, I stand with him as a peculiar person. He's more evidently peculiar, perhaps, than I am. Um, <laughs> probably some gender issues. I don't know. I don't label him as anything. But a neat guy that I'd like to get to know more. I don't have to box him into any category. Um, but some of the other guys in the gym were. And this guy's just, he's a little offsetting, the way he moves about. And, and, uh, and he is, he's, you know, puts me, puts my tith on edge a little bit. But uh, anyway, so these guys were kind of dissing him and saying to me, like, Andy, what's up with that guy? What's his problem? Is he queer? What's the deal? I said, you know what? A, he's not queer. And B, this guy has probably had a rough time most of his life, particularly with guys like you. <laughs> so give him a break, you know? He's here doing the best he can, man, you know? Don't put him in a box, right? When we do this, we become agents of the bad news not of the one who opens up for us a new horizon. The Apostle Paul implores us, see no one from a worldly point of view. We have to train ourselves to lay down the false judgments of our modern age and to see and name our fellows according to a true anthropology based on the catechism. Number 2333, Every man and woman should acknowledge and accept his sexual identity. That includes gender difference and complementarity. The harmony of society depends on how that complementarity is lived out. I'm glad to know that my particular peculiar brother is created in God's image in this profound mystery of man for woman and woman for man. That's how I see him. That's how I understand his identity. He might identify himself other than that. That's his business. I have my business to do based on the catechism. Amen? Amen. Let us see and treat people accordingly. This type of judging others by naming him or her according to an image less than what God intends usurps the role of God himself. That tendency took on a more familiar form in Jesus' day through the Pharisees. These Jewish religious leaders spun hundreds of rules from the Mosaic law and wound up entangling others in their religious tradition. Pharisees complement the worldly spirituality of homosexual fatalism. Pope Francis describes the Pharisees as infected by a spiritual worldliness a religiosity based on rigid orthodoxy, pride in that orthodoxy, yet without an inner transformation of heart. With no heart shift, these ones could impose rules, but not inspire redemption. The Pharisees tended to be punctilious, hypocritical, and uncaring towards those they served. Jesus said it best when he described the Pharisees as exchanging the commands of God for the traditions of men. Pharisaic religion in Jesus' day reduced the horizon of who God was and how he saw his children. Into that mix, Jesus brought a new kingdom in word and wonders. He invited the poor into a mercy tender enough to touch their wounds and strong enough to heal those wounds from the hazards of bad religion. It is impossible to grasp Jesus most famous statements on not judging in Luke 6, 37 through 42, and Matthew 7, 1 through 5, without understanding this almighty mercy. Today we face the kingdoms of homosexual fatalism and the kingdom of the Pharisees. In joyful opposition to both kingdoms, Jesus opens a horizon, a whole new world for us. Fittingly, he prefaces his reference in Luke to not judging by referencing mercy. He said, our father is kind to the ungrateful and wicked as your father is merciful. He proceeds 
Don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Matthew's reference is similar. Don't judge or you will be judged. In the same way you judge others, you will be judged. The measure you use will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, given the plank in your own? You hypocrite, take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brothers. Jesus is speaking to his followers who had received mercy and yet who lived in a legalistic culture. He opened their horizon through a powerful love that exposed their deepest sins and forgave them. His very love established truth in their inmost parts, thus fulfilling the law. He did not nullify the fact of sin, the moral law, but actually deepened its meaning, then filled it with mercy. These listeners had received that mercy in a merciless religious world. Would they in turn extend that mercy and so demonstrate that they belong to another kingdom? This is the essence of Jesus' exhortation to not judge. It's as if he's saying to us, consider how I've treated you. In light of the horizon I open for you, will you let go of your judgments that close the horizon of another? In light of your felony for which I treated you mercifully, will you extend mercy to his or her misdemeanor? Having been released from the prison of sin and judgment and shame, will you be my agent in releasing others from their prisons? He highlights our authority as members of this kingdom. God will judge us according to the judgments that we have made of others. Our horizon will stay as open as our hearts are towards those we are tempted to judge. Do we view them as heirs of Christ or children of the devil? as intrinsically gay or as sons and daughters of the Father, men and women of dignity created to live chaste and fruitful lives. So Jesus reminds us, identify your own poisons, spit them out in confession, drink in mercy as your cure, and extend that mercy freely to those we view as poisonous. To not do so puts us dangerously close to the Pharisees and to homosexual fatalists who live small lives and who reduce others to their small lives. Jesus came with a big kingdom and invites us into it. He may first take us down to our depths, but he does so to raise us up with mercy. And he gives us a big eternal horizon so we can see others expansively, generously. And he wants us to love others out of that largesse. Amen? Amen? So we can ask ourselves, Jesus, do we see the way you do? Not just the mere outward appearance, or not just feeling the way that this other person threatens us because of the way that they have hurt us. Could you, O oh God, Give us your eyes to see in this broken one's life the misdirected quest for love that may very well be breaking ground for divine love, the cry and cure of every human being. Pope Francis writes, one can't help but admire the resources Jesus used to dialogue with his people. I believe his secret lies in the way that he looked at people, seeing beyond their weakness and failings. We must make present to broken people the fragrance of Jesus' closeness and his personal gaze. Such tender attentiveness heals, liberates, encourages others to grow in Christ. How lovely to see others through the eyes of mercy. And how painful and how necessary it is at times to see with those same eyes the damage 
we can do to each other when the faithful act unfaithfully through sexual sin. St. Paul gives us a powerful compliment to Jesus' command to not judge when the apostle implores us as church men and women to exercise wise judgments in regards to our fellows who have fallen into grievous moral sins. Why? St. Paul understood that unchecked sexual immorality had power in the believing community to impact the purity and holiness of others. You see, Paul's Greco-Roman world differed significantly from the Hebrew community of Jesus in regards to both sexuality and spirituality. The apostle was advancing the gospel among citizens who worship many gods and goddesses and whose sexual practices reflected that diversity. Whereas Jesus liberated the poor from the legalistic shame of the Pharisee, St. Paul contended with the near shamelessness of new converts emerging out of an idolatrous, highly sensual world. So in 1 Corinthians 5, St. Paul describes a man in the Corinthian church who was committing incest with his father's wife, and the church was proud of it. The severe nature of the sexual immorality at hand, coupled with an arrogant tolerance of the sin, inspired St. Paul to exhort the members of Christ's body at Corinth. What business is it of mine to judge those who are outside of the church? But are you not to judge those inside of it? Expel the wicked brother from among you. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 and 13. In other words, we all have a responsibility to discern when the integrity of the church is being violated. That matters to Jesus, and we, we must each do our part when members are violating one another. St. Paul clearly is passing judgment on this man, and he does so without reservation. His reasons are clear. Tolerating sexual immorality among believers has a pernicious impact on the whole. Verse 6, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. It undermines the moral standards of the overall community. Commenting on Paul's judgment and discipline of this man, Pauline scholar Dr. Robert Gagnon writes, if the church refuses to take a firm stand against an obvious and severe violation of sexual immorality, then its resistance to other types of sexual immorality will be weakened beyond repair. Unlike Jewish disciples who were subject to myriad regulations concerning sexual purity, the Corinthians boasted of their liberties as a sign of their progressive, grace-filled faith. Sound familiar? St. Paul reminded them in chapters 6 and 7 of the power of the human body to bind them to intimate communion with God or enslavement to other gods and goddesses. He is simply applying Jesus' mandate. Serial, unrepentant, sexually immoral behavior puts one at risk from inheriting the kingdom of God. As Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, cut off what causes you to stumble before it sends you to hell. What matters, I think, to Jesus, to St. Paul, and Pope Francis, is that we do not overemphasize the threat of other sexual immorality. When we do, we run the risk of magnifying specks and missing our own planks. Two keys here. Although we can and must judge certain acts as being grave, we must entrust ultimate judgment of persons to the justice and mercy of God. That's in the Catechism 186. And secondly, the basis for such moral discernment is our personal reckoning with our own moral vulnerabilities. 
Scripture and church teaching command us over and over to make wise moral judgments about ourselves. The horizon Jesus is open for us frees us to make these wise moral judgments. And we must, if we want to engender life in our fellows, not engender confusion or fear or lust. When I started Desert Stream Ministries 35 years ago in a church that was in revival, hundreds of people coming to Christ, all pagan, Los Angeles, certainly the Greco-Roman world, not the religious parochial world um, of Jesus' time. And so many people were coming in and saying, how then do I live and love? And I was commissioned to be a bridge of sorts for them in the community. And I was a work in progress. I was growing in chastity, had not quite arrived. I actually can't say I have arrived en route to full chastity, just for the record. It's just to say then I was much less mature. And I discovered that I, as I was cast before all of these very vulnerable and seductive people, I realized, you know what? I'm getting triggered here. They are inspiring me to pagan acts of worship. So I need the boundaries. I need certain things in place to manage my own moral vulnerabilities so that my good news remains good news for them. Yes and amen, it's not their problem. It's my problem. And I've got to take responsibility for ensuring a clear and safe place where they can have their issues and I'm not gonna make decisions to hurt them based on my vulnerabilities. Amen? I love lay run ministry, we need it. I believe in the rise of the laity at this point in time. It's the only way we're gonna be able to do the work of this ministry and that has special vulnerabilities to it, which involves boundaries. Gotta have them, folks. We want our churches to be safe and clean sanctuaries, but still earthy and honest enough to welcome dirty sheep so that they can have a fighting chance to become clean. I think this is Pope Francis' main point. Rather than a church which clings to its own security, he wants a church that's bruised and hurting because it's been out on the streets. He writes, if something should rightly disturb and trouble us, it's because so many of our brothers and sisters are living without the light, strength, and consolation born of friendship with Jesus, without a community of faith to support them. Might we be empowered by a renewed gospel that has power to open the horizon of others and grant them a new vision and a new hope for their lives? These men and women surround us daily in our mundane lives. Persons with same gender attraction who are blinded by both homosexual fatalism and the stigmatism of the Pharisee. Might we trust the truth that has set us free, divine love that surpasses our weaknesses, that compels us to build bridges rather than walls with others. Let us not be content with being a tidy, truthful church, but a messy, fruitful one. Let's manifest the mercy that has power to open for all a whole new horizon. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Postscript. I'm in a parish. I'm a parish guy. I'm not so much bigger world, diocese. You know, my evangelical friends are like, you need to talk to Pope Francis. I'm like, yeah, I put in a call. <laughs> what are you thinking, people? Busy guy. So my thing is, do it where you worship. You know, like dig in where you worship, where you're known. You know, the, the, the beautiful people that are with you every day in Mass, that are there digging in the garden or, you know, the sacristans and, 
and the ones feeding the poor and going to the rest homes. You know, do it with them. Do it with them. Don't be some big dude, you know. Do it where you take communion and become known there. That's what I've been doing in my church. I love it. I have such a great parish. I have the best priest. I'm so blessed. Uh, and uh, so my friend and I, Becky and others, we just started praying. I said, Pastor, man, can we just do like a group for chastity? Just, can we just pray for chastity? Where our, our diocese has been rocked by abuse things and the church becoming suspect, you know, the agent of sexual brokenness, not the refuge for the sexually broken. I'm like, that's not true at all. This is a deeply healing place. So let's start. Let's start being a healing place. And so we began to gather, and then we got the Encourage group in there. Courage had started in another parish down the way. And uh, so I thought, man, could we do Living Waters here? That'd be awesome. It's a more deep thing. It takes longer, the laity. It takes a team, you know. And the pastor said, yeah, why don't you do that? That'd be great. Takes an adventurous priest. Honestly, priest, you got to be adventurous. You got to take some risks, right? And it's hard to take risks today because we're also paranoid of litigation and charges and marches and, you know, the homosexual fatalists shutting down our church, you know, all of that. You got to take risks, people. You got to. It's not going to be seamless. But my priest said, yeah, do it. You're a good guy. You seem pretty clean and you're doing other kinds of service, so why not do this one? So I said, okay, let's do it. So we started doing it. Well, we started. We were preparing and, you know, gathering the team. And this is kind of a complicated thing. And so listen to this. So there's a guy down the street from the church who's, um, you know, swamped by gay porn. And uh, he's married to a woman, but it's all kind of fallen apart. And he's just desperate. He's not even a Catholic. He's a God-fearer. But all he knows is that his life is coming undone. And the people that he loves most are getting further and further away. He could see the writing of the wall on the wall. I'm becoming a divided, demonized man. And that is not what I was created for. And my kids and my spouse remind me of that every day. He was desperate. So he just thought, I'm going anywhere to get help. So he went running down the street. He ran into my parish. He said to the, you know, the shaken up receptionist, you know, I need to see a priest, you know, last rites. <laughs> I need a priest. And he goes, well, okay, well, there's this one here. This was just the priest that I had met with who was kind of sponsoring the Living Waters thing. I'd given the priest all this material and stuff. So the lady said, yeah, just go in there. So, so he went in there and, and the priest said, yes, I just happen to have a pile of materials for you. We're starting a group here for men and women coming out of homosexuality, sexual addiction, infidelities related to marriage. It was amazing. It was such a confirmation to the priests that, you know what? Yes, we need priests. We need the good of confession and absolution and all the sacraments that come through the priest. And we need empowered lay people providing an infrastructure in our parishes that can rightfully catch and help clean those who need a lot more time and attention than what one or two priests can give, a parish of 500 to 2,000. So I'm so grateful to the Lord. He's moving. He's moving. He's moving. The enemy is taking many captives, but those with ears to hear and eyes to see, they're crying out for mercy, and they're crying out for it among a group of people who are gathering in Jesus' name. And that's us. So let's get about the business of it, okay? Amen? Amen. 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 That's it. Thank you.